Hello and welcome to Year 11 Chemistry Paper 2 Revision Organic Chemistry and this is part 2 of a two part video series on organic chemistry and in this we get on to the real organic chemistry the triple, the real harder stuff. So welcome triple science student you're really going to learn some proper organic chemistry today. So first of all we're going to start off with alkenes. Alkenes are like alkanes if they are small hydrocarbons except for one crucial difference. They are the carbon-carbon double bond. They are said to be unsaturated hydrocarbons. Alkanes are saturated. They don't have any carbon-carbon double bonds. Alkenes are unsaturated with the general formula CnH2n. Here is the simplest alkene possible because it needs a carbon-carbon double bond. You need at least two carbons, so there's no such thing as methane. For example, and you do need to be able to draw a dot cross diagram. Remember from paper one doing them, you do need to be able to draw a dot cross diagrams of double bonds and single bonds, as you can see right here. So you need to know the first four alkenes. There's ethene, there's propene. The double bond can go anywhere, by the way, but it generally is tend to draw to the left. Here's a butene with it in the middle and pentene as well. Okay, so you can see these are the structure of the first four alkenes. You need to be able to draw all of them. The test for alkanes versus alkenes, you've seen this before. If there are no double bonds, bromine will stay orange. If there are double bonds, if it's unsaturated, then it will be decolorized. And you need to know as triple science students that the bromine is added in an addition reaction which breaks the carbon carbon double, double, double bond to form 1,2-dibromoethane, which is colorless. Now I want to talk to you about incomplete combustion. If you've ever seen plastics burn, or they don't burn very well, basically. There's a lot of smoke, and well, you can see from that plume there, it's not very nice, and put, it, it just melts. Alkanes are used as shields. Alkenes are used to make plastic. It's very rare they're used as shields. So you do need to know about their combustion still. So what is incomplete combustion? Complete combustion is when a fuel has enough oxygen. Incomplete combustion is when a fuel does not have enough oxygen to burn completely. Not all the carbon atoms get fully oxidized to carbon dioxide, but instead are either only partially oxidized to carbon monoxide terribly dangerous substance, or not oxid oxidized at all, and they stay as carbon, and that's what we see as smoke, the carbon particulates is smoke. The other are colorless gases, the smoke is the carbon itself. So carbon monoxide is a silent killer, it's responsible for a lot of deaths every year, generally from faulty boilers and heaters, and is caused by incomplete combustion, mainly of alkanes because they're used as fuels, but what it does is this, is it binds irreversibly to hemoglobin and red blood cells, meaning that they can no longer carry oxygen and you effectively suffocate to death, okay? So be very careful with carbon monoxide that is colorless, odorless, and tasteless, but you need to install a carbon monoxide alarm and one of these should definitely be installed in all of your houses right by your boiler unit. Here's an example of how incomplete combustion of alkanes could occur. Normally, the oxygen tube that allows air, air in is here. Here, a bird's nest in the top right is blocked. It. That can cause incomplete combustion and deadly carbon monoxide leaking out. So overall, you know the equation of complete combustion from the previous video. Here's the equation of, in, equation of incomplete combustion, where I have a pentene here. And with oxygen, I can either get carbon, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and I always get water. But this equation is not balanced. Here's the balanced equation where they all add up perfectly. Okay, now, so this question here, comparing ethane with ethene for six marks, telling you to refer to their structure and bonding and reactions. You would think this is a brilliant question. Just ask me to compare ethane and ethene? Easy. It was answered terribly in the real life exam by students. They did really badly. I don't know why, but here are so many differences. The main thing is students are bad on similarity. So let's have a look at the marking scheme now. Both are hydrocarbons. Both contain two carbon atoms. Ethane has six. Ethene has four. 
You can talk about ethane having single carbon-carbon bonds and ethene has a double bond. Really, really easy. And they both contain CH bonds, okay? There's so many similarities that people did not mention. And also, as regards to reactions, both can be involved in complete combustion reactions. Uh, incomplete combustion is more likely with alkenes, though. Ethane does decolorize bromine water. Ethane does not. And ethene is more reactive than hydrogen because of the carbon carbon double bond. What's highlighted in red, you do not know yet, but you will all know in a minute. So here are the reactions of alkenes, and we're going to talk about addition reactions first. The first one is hydrogenation. You have ethene, and you add hydrogen gas with a catalyst, and you can make ethane. You have pentene, and you add hydrogen gas with a catalyst, and you can make pentene. I don't really know why you'd want to do it, given that alkenes are formed from the cracking of alkanes, but you can do it, you just need to be aware. Next is the steam hydration of ethene to make ethanol. And we're gonna talk about this in a bit of detail because it comes up quite a lot in your exam. Steam means it's done at a temperature over 100 degrees, it's done at 300 degrees. And we're gonna talk about the reaction conditions in a moment. And does know that it forms ethanol. OH is the o ethanol group there at the end. So the formation of alcohols from alkenes using a catalyst, okay? So e ethanol can be mixed with ethene with steam and passing it over a catalyst. You can see it breaks the carbon-carbon double bond, forming ethanol. Here we can form pentanol. If I did hexene, it would be hexanol and so on and so forth. It's just an addition reaction. Now, making ethanol, well, we haven't been using these industrial ways of making ethanol. We've been making ethanol for thousands of years the old-fashioned way, okay? And ethanol has a lot of uses, but it was mainly used in the right for alcoholic drinks. It's only recently we started using them for other ways. So, let's compare the old-school way of making ethanol with the new-school industrial way. For example, I know that's Tupac on the left. I have no idea who that is on the right, to be honest. I think I'm showing my age. Now, okay, ethene and water. Let's take a look here. The steam hydration of ethene to make ethanol. Now, here is the reaction conditions. This is what happens, okay? You get ethene gas, you get steam, and you put them into a reactant vessel at 300 degrees Celsius, a pressure of 60 to 70 atmospheres with a phosphoric acid catalyst, and that makes ethanol. This reaction actually has a very low yield of around 5%, but the fact that the unreacted gases are constantly recycled means you are not concerned about the yield. Now, that sounds familiar because it's very like the Haber process. You are trying to keep the equilibrium to the right, and it looks quite similar. You're recycling the gases, Slightly different reaction conditions, but ultimately you're getting liquid ethanol or liquid ammonia. Now, here are some real life exam questions. Name the process used to produce ethene from large hydrocarbon molecules. You should remember that as cracking, that's part A. And describe the conditions used to produce ethene from large hydrocarbon molecules. That is high temperature and a catalyst. Moving on in this question, they then talk about ethanol and so on. So you need to talk about, really, this is a rate of reaction, topic six question, put in an organic chemistry contrast. The Ford reaction is exothermic. Explain how the conditions as economically as possible. Your answer will be incredibly similar to the Haber process, as you are about to see. So let's have a look here, as you can play and pause through these. Rate, high temperature, more frequent collisions, a higher pressure, more frequent collisions, and a catalyst lowers the activation energy. For yield, you don't want the temperature to be too high because the Ford reaction is exothermic. I'd use that classic phrase, a compromised temperature. And if you look at the reaction, you do want a high pressure because there are fewer moles of gas than on the right-hand side. Here's what I've just said, compromised temperature. And again, a compromised pressure as well, because maintaining a pressure costs a lot of money as well, and is, can be unsafe. Now we're going to look at the old school method that's been making 
alcohol for thousands of years, mainly for human consumption, mainly to get people drunk. And I did read a very worrying book that a lot of decisions made by world leaders over history were when they were under the fear influence of alcohol. It's something that's never really thought about, but a lot of people in the old world were alcoholics, I'm afraid. Now, they did like their beer, but they did know how to make it, and they made it by fermentation. They had no idea of the chemistry of what was going on, but they knew it got you drunk. So if you get sugar, you add it to yeast in anaerobic conditions, get rid of the oxygen, it will produce carbon dioxide and your desired ethanol product. If I take the sugar from apples, I'll make cider. If I take the sugar from barley, I'll make beer. And if I take the sugar from... Uh, uh, grapes you'll make wine but what about spirits okay you can only make uh, ethanol naturally up to around 15 percent because the yeast starts being killed in its own waste ethanol is a waste product and the yeast effectively drowns in its own way so you can't really get above 15 percent naturally to get up to spirit level you need to distill it further and we've looked at distillation before where you can increase the alcohol content because alcohol has a lower boiling point than water. So let's compare this table of the old versus new method fermentation versus the steam hydration of ethene. First of all, fermentation is renewable because plants are renewable. Ethene is from a non-renewable fossil fuel. Fermentation is a batch process, it means you have to do it one batch at a time. So it's a bit inefficient, whereas hydration, you can keep the hydrating that ethene all day. It's more efficient. Rate of reaction is a lot quicker with hydration. And take a look at purity, okay? Fermentation, you get all the sugars and all the bits of fruit, and it's a pretty impure ethanol. You can get up to 100% pure ethanol with the steam hydration because there are no other products there. And finally, reaction conditions. Well, fermentation uses yeast. Yeast is a living organism with enzymes, and enzymes denature at a high temperature. So you probably want a normal atmospheric temperature of around 25 degrees Celsius and normal pressure, whereas with steam hydration, you want high temperature and high pressure. You do need to be able to compare these ways of making it. You can have a quick read of that. And take a look at the atom economy, it's 100% because it's only one product. Just play and pause as you can read through this. And here's a real life exam question asking you to compare from the flow diagram, which is better, crude oil, alkanes, which are then cracked to alkenes which are then hydrated to ethanol or fermentation of plants the old school way so describe how the solution of sugar and water is used to produce the mixture of ethanol you would say you add yeast and it's called fermentation and also maybe you could mention the absence of alcohol it is anaerobic respiration and a temperature range of around room temperature Describe how distillation is used to separate a mixture of ethanol and water. Well, they have different boiling points. Ethanol has a lower boiling point than water, so it will vaporize first, separating the mixtures, and you then condense the vapor. What type of substance is ethanol? Well, when it's used to remove stains, it will be a solvent, I would say. Grape juice contains sugar, and what is added? It is yeast. Okay, a solvent, sugar, and yeast. Next, we're on to the halogenation of alkenes. This is another addition reaction where you only have one product, and you've already seen one halogenation, the classic bromine test for alkanes versus alkenes, but there are others we will look at now. For example, propane, I can add chlorine, and I get dichloropropane. It breaks the carbon, carbon double bond. Here I'm adding bromine to butene to get dibromobutane, again breaking the carbon-carbon double bond, and so on. And here I'm getting the same thing, but the bromine has added in a different place, because as you can see, the carbon-carbon double bond is in a different place. 
So we're looking at addition polymerization now. When you think of polymers, just think of plastics. Plastics and polymers are the same thing, okay? So what is addition polymerization? When many monomers, and you're going to find out that these monomers are alkene, alkenes, join together in a polymerization reaction which breaks the carbon-carbon double bond and it requires high pressure and a catalyst. I'm going to say it again because they ask it so often to define addition polymerization. When many monomers join together in a polymerization reaction which breaks the carbon-carbon double bond. So there's loads of monomers which join together to form a polymer chain. So in addition polymerization, because there's only one product, here is polyethene, where many ethene monomers join together in a polymerization reaction which breaks the carbon-carbon double bond. Now here you see two ethene monomers join together to form two uh, poly polyethene. In reality, it could be thousands or even millions of repeating units. I like to think of it like dominoes falling. Once one double bond is broken, then the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and so on. So here is high pressure and the catalyst or the reaction conditions to make polyethene. And polyethene is that kind of flexible plastic bags that you would use for shopping and stuff like that. But say I wanted to make, say, a harder plastic, well, then I might use propene, okay? So I can make polypropene from many single propene monomers and that will make a much harder type of plastic that you can use for like bowls and stuff. Again, it's non-biodegradable, they'll last for ages. We've all seen plastic bowls before. The key point here is this, you have to be able to draw the monomer and the key point here is you can see you break the carbon-carbon double bond, you straighten everything up and you add those two dark green dashes at the side to indicate that there is more than one molecule. Here is three propene monomers joining together to form polypropene in a polymerization reaction. And here's the next one, there's four of them, polyethene, polypropene, now we're onto polychloroethene, which in America is actually called polyvinyl chloride, PVC, it kind of gives you that leathery kind of fake plastic look, although it can be hardened to make gutters and stuff as well, and so on. Now look again at polychloroethene. One of the hydrogens has been replaced with chlorine. When you are asked to draw the monomer, the repeating unit, you draw those square brackets, you put the molecule in, straighten everything up, and then break the carbon-carbon double bond, you only have a single bond, and then have those dashes either side to indicate that it's not just one molecule, it's lots. And finally, at the bottom, N means it could be any number from a thousand to a million. It really, that's what N stands for. Here's another picture of the exact same thing. N is a big number. Now, and again, it can make ridiculous clothing. Okay, so here you also need to be able to work backwards. They can give you the polymer and they'll ask you to draw the monomer itself. Okay, so drawing the monomer is going back to adding the double bond and then turning everything diagonally instead. So you have to be able to work forwards and backwards. Now we're on to our final addition polymer, Teflon. Tetra polytetrafluoroethene, fluoroethene, Teflon is non-stick, dirt just doesn't stick to it, it's great for saucepans and you can get Teflon clothing as well, if you work outdoors it will stop dirt sticking to your clothing, and in Teflon all four hydrogens have been replaced with fluorine, tetra means four, polytetrafluoroethene is Teflon, and that is another one you have to be aware of, okay? Now, the problem with polymers and plastics is they are non-biodegradable. That means the de uh, decomposing bacteria that would break down orga normal organic matter, like our bodies, for example, do not break down plastics, which is a big problem because they just fill up in landfill sites if we don't recycle them properly. Look at the state of this place, okay? We are turning our planet into a rubbish dump, and that's just land. The sea is full of plastics. 
and particularly dangerous microscopic plastics that fish eat and accumulate up the food chain. It's really terrible what we're doing to the oceans. So what you need to stop turning earth into a garbage can and reduce, reuse and recycle your plastics, please. So give one problem in the exam questions caused by non-degradable biodegradable polymers. They will last for years and years in landfill sites because they're non-biodegradable. They're not going to be broken down. And part B asks you this, okay, complete the structure of the monomer of this. Well, I've worked backwards and I've added the double bond and I've diagonalized everything. And this question here is more topic 10, but it does ask you that PVC softens and melts. It's a thermo softening polymer. The key point is that there's no cross links between the chains. So only weak intermolecular forces, which do not require a lot of energy to overcome. You heard that a lot when I was doing my chemistry paper one video, but this is more on topic 10, which just came up in this question. Again, draw the monomer, complete figure three. I've had to work backwards. Now I didn't diagonalize everything up, but I'll still get all the marks here, but I've added the double bond and you will get full marks for doing that. Name the monomer used to form polychloroethene. Well, it's what's in the brackets, chloroethene. Whatever in the brackets is the monomer. Shows the equation. Well, here I have added a double bond on the left. That's part of one mark. Another mark has gone from changing it to a single bond. And the third mark goes for the red line either side of the carbon, indicating that it goes on and on. And what type of polymer it is in addition polymer. Now we're on to alcohols. Alcohols. Now when you think of alcohols, you're probably more thinking of stuff like this, but we have much more industrial uses for alcohol as well. Okay, it can be used for a wide variety of cleaning products, solvents. It's not just for getting people drunk, okay? And for fuel as you're about to see. You need to be able to draw the structure of the first four alcohols. It's pretty easy. So instead of having a H, you just add an OH at the end, okay? That's easy, okay? Some people add O slash H or OH, it doesn't matter. You do need to be able to know the names and structures of the first four alcohols. So spend a moment looking at these, methanol, ethanol, propanol, and butanol. Some people draw the O and the H with a dash, it doesn't matter either way. Know that it can be branched. I've never seen it asked in an exam. I would always just draw the, draw the OH group at the end, but they can be branched with the OH adding on to different carbon atoms, but I haven't really seen it examined. So what are the properties and reactions of alcohol? Firstly, they are flammable and they can participate in combustion reactions and can be used as fuels. Here is a balanced equation for the combustion of ethanol, which will be the most commonly used one as fuels. So gasohol is particularly popular in Brazil and America, and it's a mixture of gasoline and alcohol that is used as a fuel. Basically, you, if you use alcohol in the mix, you are reducing the amount of gasoline you need. And as gasoline is a non-renewable re resource and alcohol is a renewable resource, it will make your supplies of gasoline last longer. So it's Brazil, 25% for one country or 26.1 is huge. Now, these are the sugar cane crops and this all looks lovely and picturesque, but from a scientist's point of view, it's actually not very biodiverse. They have to cut down huge areas of rainforest to make space for these fields. So it isn't good for nature or biodiversity. Next, the solubility of alcohols in water. Well, if they weren't soluble, you wouldn't have alcoholic drinks. So the first three are 100% soluble in water, methanol, ethanol, and propanol. But as the hydrocarbon chain gets longer and longer and longer, they get less soluble. Butanol is only partially soluble in water. And as you can see, they get dramatically less from 1.1 Heptanol with seven carbon atoms is barely soluble at all. And the reason is this. The OH group is soluble in water. The CH group is not soluble. For a small molecule, the OH group is a big part of it. I mean, you know, H2O, it's pretty much is water. 
Whereas if you take out a long hydrocarbon chain, the insoluble part is much long, much more dominant than the soluble part, so it won't dissolve. And the classic example will be oil and water. Oil is very much like a long hydrocarbon, saturated fat, polyunsaturated fat oils. They're all very similar chemically. They just don't mix with water. This random reaction is on your course. I don't really know why. You just throw it in there. The reaction of sodium with ethanol, you do need to know because it's on your AQA syllabus. But just know that hydrogen gas is produced. I don't really know why they've thrown it in randomly, though I can't really say why. Next, we're on to the oxidation of alcohols, okay? When you crack a bottle of wine, you might need it aerate for a little bit and enjoy a glass. Oh, you're too young to be thinking of like that, but... Your parents or someone at home might, okay? But if you leave your wine open for a couple of days, it goes off. What's happened? Why is your wine gone bad? Well, because it's been oxidized, and it's been oxidized to vinegar, okay? Literally, the ethanol is oxidized to ethanoic acid, which is vinegar. Now, I'm going to be talking about ethanoic acid and other carboxylic acids later, but just know it makes your wine go off if you leave it in the air for too long. You just add oxygen, methanol will be oxidized to methanoic acid. This is what has the most common one, ethanol to ethanoic acid, and so on and so forth. You can follow that. If you add oxygen to an alcohol, it becomes a carboxylic acid. Now, it's a two-step process. Actually, you don't need to know the intermediate ethanol. Just know the end product. It's vinegar, ethanoic acid. And I don't like drinking vinegar with my dinner, okay? So there, you need to also know the industrial oxidation of ethanol. This is something that when you really want ethanoic acid, you need heat and an acid catalyst. So what about carboxylic acids? They're our next organic chemical group. They have a COOH bond that you draw like that, C double bond O and the diagonal, and then an O and a H. Some people draw the O and H together without the dash. It doesn't matter. You will you can draw it either way you want. And here's a more colorful version for you to have a look at. You do need, again, the first four, methanoic, ethanoic, propanoic, and butanoic acids. First property is they are weak acids. You've come across this in topic three in chemistry when we did strong and weak acids because they do not fully ionize in solution. Ethanoic acid, 99% of it doesn't ionize, only 1% of it does. So strong acids fully ionize in solution. Ethanoic acids do not. So that means, how do you know? Because of that reversible reaction symbol they do not fully ionize in solution. For a hydrochloric acid, you just have a one-way arrow. Here you have a reversible reaction. So in the pH scale of things, as I just showed you just before, a 0.1 molar solution of HCl has a pH of 1. Now the pH scale is by 10, so a pH of 2 is 10. A pH of 3 is 100 times less H plus ions. It's only 1% ionized. And I've underlined hydrochloric acid and vinegar to show you the difference on the pH scale. So, here's some more exam practice for you. What is the name of the liquid? Well, I can see L over there by the HDO. It's water, not that deep. Vinegar contains a solution of ethanoic acid. Now, there's plenty of ways to do this mathematically. For me, I divide 20 by 400 to find out what's in one centimeter cubed, and then multiply my answer by 1,000 because one decimeter cubed is the same as 1,000 centimeter cubed. Whatever way you do it, your answer is 50 grams. Next, here's some other questions on carboxylic acids. You have to be able to fill in the formula. HCOOH is methanoic acid. And just bear in mind the pH there is the lowest of the lot. Propanoic, I didn't space to write the acid, but I would write acid in my exam. Now, ethanoic acid ionizes in water. Ethanoic acid is a weak acid, showing incomplete or partial ionization. Why? Because the reaction is reversible. It's not, reaction with, it's not reversible with strong acids, but it is reversible with weak acids. Next, a student adds a solution of ethanoic acid to zinc carbonate. 
explain what happens to the mass of the flask. Well, the mass of the flask will decrease because the carbonate will produce carbon dioxide gas, which escapes from the flask. This picture may be familiar with you. You could measure the rate of reaction here with a very sensitive balance by measuring the mass loss of CO2, but you would need a very sensitive balance. But that's what you would see, is the mass will decrease because carbon dioxide gas is escaping. Why is the rate of reaction with methanoic acid greater than with ethanoic acid? Well, this comes down to the pH scale. Methanoic acid has a lower pH than ethanoic acid, that means it produces more H plus ions. It is ionized more easily. If that is the case, well, there you go. It has a lower pH, so it has a higher concentration of hydrogen ions. And we are back to our topic six, rate of reaction. There are more collisions per unit time. You will remember me saying that a lot, I will hope. Next, we're on to our final kind of group of single molecules, anyhow. Esters, okay? When I add uh, alcohol to a carboxylic acid, I get a product called an ester. And you're going to see it. It's a lot easier to see visu visually and water. This is called a condensation reaction because water is removed to form the bond. So as you can see, the OH group of the alcohol lines up with the OH group of the ethanoic acid. The OH, H2O is removed, OH comes from the ethanoic acid, the H comes from the alcohol, and it forms what we call a uh, ester bond, C-O-O-H, C double bond O and a single bond O. That's called an ester bond. Now, the naming of it comes, the right-hand side comes from the alcohol part, ethyl, ethyl and the left hand comes from the carboxylic part, ethanoate. So this is ethyl ethanoate, and that is the main one you're going to be asked on your course. Although I'll show you a couple more examples as well. How do you do it? Again, acid and a catalyst. So ethanoic acid will react with ethanol to form ethyl ethanoate, and we call this an ester. And carboxylic acid reacts with an alcohol to form an ester and water. Again, here we go, ethyl ethanoate. In English, a condensation reaction, that means the removal of water, occurs between the OH group of the alcohol and the COOH of the carboxylic acid to form an ester bond. That's if they ask you to describe what happens in your exam. And as I said, the right-hand part comes from the alcohol, the left-hand part comes from the carboxylic acid. Here's methyl ethanoate butyl ethanoate, and here's some others as well. Now, the main property of esters is they're volatile. That means they have a low boiling point. When you put, squirt perfume on your skin, the heat of your skin is enough to evaporate the perfume and cause that nice smell. So that's why perfumes are mainly ester-based. But Say I don't want them just one ester. Say I want loads of them. Say I want a polyester. I'm sure you're all familiar with polyester. There's a very high chance you're wearing some polyester clothing right now, okay? Polyester is what we call a condensation polymer. So how instead do I go from making one ester bond to making thousands? Well, here is the secret. And here's a lot of uses. The secret of making condensation polymers is this. Instead of a single alcohol with one OH group, I use a diol. This would be ethane, ethane diol with two OH groups. So I use, instead of a single alcohol, I use a diol. Well, guess what? Instead of a single carboxylic acid, I'm going to use a dicarboxylic acid. And as you can see, there is the carboxyl group on either side of the molecule, and here's what happens overall. A dicarboxylic acid reacts with a dialcohol to form a polyester. As you can see, there is still an OH group and a COOH group free on either side to continue the chain reaction. So in general, just draw one 
put it in the square brackets and write N and just be aware that this could repeat for thousands or even millions of times. This is how polyesters are formed. A dicarboxylic acid reacts with a dialcohol to form a polyester. With the removal of water, it is a condensation polymer. Here's another example for you might like prefer this visual example. They don't go too deep on this. This is just getting you prepared for A-level chemistry. They presume a lot of triple students will be doing A-level chemistry. So, what is the display structural formula of ethanoic acid of with ethanol? In other words, ethyl ethanoate. Well, it's only the bottom one that makes sense there. Draw a circle around an alcohol functional group. Well, OH is the alcohol functional group. And A and B, clearly water will be removed in a condensation polymer. And C, well, it's just going to be hydrochloric acid instead. Now, it's just a one more question, and I wouldn't expect all students to get A and C, but that's your answer there. Name the functional group in monomer B. Well, it's the OH, the alcohol group in monomer A. It will be the carboxyl group in monomer B. When they join together, they form a, ba, ba, bum, a polyester. And what's the removal? A condensation polymer removes water. And why does this type of polyester melt when it is heated? Well, it is a thermal softening. This is more, again, topic 10. But it is uh, something I'm going to introduce to you now. There are no cross links between the chains. So only weak intermolecular forces, which do not require a lot of energy to overcome. That is why this polyester melts. Now, here are some other exam questions. Draw the equation again. That's an addition polymerization at the top. And then they have a condensation polymerization as part B. And you're asked to compare addition polymerization with condensation polymerization. This is a very commonly asked exam question, and here's what they're looking for you to say, okay? Polyethene produced by addition polymerization, whereas polyesters are condensation. Polyethene only contains one monomer, ethene, whereas polyester contains two, that would be the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. Polyethene is produced from ethene and alkene, whereas polyester, well, that's just what I've said, a diol and a dicarboxylic acid. Polyethene is the only product where, as polyester, water is removed in a condensation and reaction. And yeah, they'd be the main things I would be saying there. So we're nearly finished. We're on to our last part, naturally occurring polymers. So this would be pretty much organic or life. We are... Organic chemistry is a whole branch of chemistry, and it is the chemistry of life. And it is the chemistry of carbon, because carbon has this pretty unique ability to form these gigantic molecules like DNA and proteins that we need for life. And we're going to focus on DNA and protein as our naturally occurring polymers. Firstly, proteins are a polymer of amino acids, okay? So you have an NH2 group we call the amino group. Never mind what's in the middle, ignore it completely. And on the right-hand side, you have the carboxyl group. And what happens is this. Okay, it is quite similar, to, just to show you why the Haber process, why am I bringing this up? 80% of ammonia is used to make fertilizers. That is used to make the amino group. If the plants have loads of uh, nitrogen in the soil, it means they can make loads of proteins and will grow very fast. That's why for, you need ammonia in fertilizers. And yeah, there are 20 essential amino acids. You need to know the structures of all of these for your exams. Only messing, of course you don't. No, no, that would be crazy. But I do want you to know that they each have an NH2, an amino group, and a carboxylic acid group. This means they can form chains infinitely long in a condensation reaction. Now, I'm going to show you the formation of just a dipeptide, two amino acids joining together. But if you understand it for two, you will understand it for two million. So, 
the carboxyl group of the glycine there lines up with the amino group of the other glycine to form a peptide bond in a condensation reaction. And you can see that the amino group and carboxyl can then join again and again and again to form chains infinitely long that we call polypeptides which fold into proteins. I kind of like to think of the analogy of hands. Your left hand could be the amino group, your right hand could be the carboxyl group, and it doesn't matter what's in the middle. It is feasible for the whole world to form a whole chain of hands. It is technically possible no matter what's in the middle. So here's an example of a protein. Here's hemoglobin. This would be called a condensation polymer. And just just to be aware how often this occurs in your body, 2 million red blood cells are produced in your body every second. On every one of those 2 million red blood cells, there's 260 million hemoglobin molecules, which means 520 hemoglobin proteins are synthesized in your body every single second. 500 20 million condensation polymers, and that's just hemoglobin. There's lots of other proteins aside. That is pretty mind-blowing if you ask me. The final thing we have to do is DNA. DNA is also a polymer because it's repeating units, and it is a repeating unit of these things called nucleotides, which is a sugar phosphate backbone. You should know this from your... Uh, Biology studies of biology, and they are linked to four molecules called bases A, C, G, and T. A bond to T, C bond to G. So they don't go too deep here. It does say that the structure of DNA is a double helix, and so on. And one final thing they talk have mentioned before is starch. Starch is also a polymer made from glucose. You don't need to know the structure of that glucose until A level. So just look at the hexagon shapes, but starch is a polymer of glucose stuck together as well. So here are some examples, final part here. Name the monomer from, monomers from which starch and proteins are produced. Well, starch, glucose, proteins, amino acids. And finally, describe the structure of DNA. Two polymer chains wrapped around in a double helix with four different monomers, A, T, G, and C nucleotides. And that is it. That is organic chemistry completely covered. Well done for sticking with it. I know it's a tough topic, and I wish you the best of luck. We're done. I believe in you, and I'll see you for our next video series. All the best. Take care.